Is everyone awake? No. No. Yes. no. Somewhat awake? Well, I know it's early, I know it's the middle of the week, I know you're tired, but I know that as you apply your heart to listen to God's Word this morning, um, I believe God will bless you and encourage you. We're going to be continue to look at pressure points this morning in the book of James. We've looked at trials and temptations so far this week, things that we all deal with. And in just a couple of minutes, we're going to look at another pressure point of life, one that might not be as obvious as trials and temptations are, but it's one that all of us deal with in one way or another. But before we get there, I just for a moment want to just read a few verses to you from Ephesians chapter 1. Because I just want to remind ourselves about how God sees us and what God thinks about us. And because it really helps us to understand our perspective on these pressure points. But Ephesians chapter 1, and, and look at, at verse 4. Actually, just look at, let's begin in verse 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. I just want to remind you that as we're talking about pressure points, as we're talking about these areas of our life that put great pressure on us and these places in our life where we have to choose whether we're going to believe in God or believe God, whether we're going to trust Him and walk by faith or we're going to live by our own natural instinct and plans, I want you to realize that the God who asks you to trust Him the God who understands the pressures of life and who is asking you to listen to his wisdom is the God who loved you and chose you, who adopted you. He loves you with such an incredible love. And he has such an amazing plan for your life. He adopted you that you might be holy, set apart, and blameless for him. He has a great, great plan for your life. And so when we think about the things that James deals with and, and, and tells us to, to be aware of and to deal with in our life, I want you to realize that it's in the context of this amazing, loving relationship that God chooses to pursue with us. Isn't that an amazing thought this morning? That the God of the universe loves you. He chose you and He pursues you with His love and His grace and His mercy. And He invites you to listen to his wisdom. And James is very much a book of wisdom. In fact, it's been described by some as the Proverbs of the New Testament. We get a lot of wisdom. It covers a lot of subjects and topics, and all of them point to the wisdom of God. And here's the thing. We all need the wisdom of God, don't we? We all need, because here's, we might think that we're pretty smart, but none of us, none of us are as smart as we think we are. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived, and he made a lot of dumb choices, right? And I think it sort of highlights that even the wisest man who ever lived was lost without God's wisdom. And when he didn't follow God's wisdom, it brought a lot of grave consequences into his life. So we all need the wisdom of God, and it comes out of this amazing love relationship that God has with us. So with that in mind, turn to James chapter 2. As we look at a pressure this morning that's not as obvious as trials or temptation, but just as real. And it has to do with how we treat people and how we look at each other. And this was an issue when James was writing to the early church. It's been an issue throughout every stage of human history and it's an issue today in our lives. How do we treat people? How do we look at people? So let's begin. James chapter 2 and we'll just start with verse 1. James says, My brothers... Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. James says, show no partiality. What does it mean to show partiality? The word partiality means an unfair bias in, fair, in light of one thing or person compared with another. It's the idea of playing favorites. How many of you have ever experienced that? Right, let me ask you this way. How many feel like someone's ever played favorites either with you or against you? Anybody ever been there? All right. So this is common ground that we have this morning. We're all familiar with the fact that sometimes, for whatever reason, we tend to favor some over others. 
And this was an issue as James writes to the church. He says, my dear brothers, this is a little different translation. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim that you have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people more than others? I think that helps bring this verse to light. He says, don't show partiality or favorites as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He says, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as someone who's experienced the radical love and grace and mercy and kindness of our Savior, we are then to reflect that in our relationships with one another. But it doesn't always happen like that, does it? And James addresses it because it ought not to be. So look at verse 2. He, he tells them about what's happening in their situation. He says, for instance, suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in shabby clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or I'll sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that you are guided by wrong motives. You see, the culture then, as now, had a tendency to favor the wealthy over the poor and to treat people who had wealth differently than people who didn't. And it was going on not just in the culture, but it was happening in the church. That in the very place where the ground should have been seen as level, they were showing partiality. They were playing favorites. And in this context, they were saying people were showing up for their worship gatherings and if somebody showed up that they didn't know and they appeared to be very wealthy, they treated them like they were really special. And they said, hey, we've got a perfect seat for you right up front. But if poor people showed up and they weren't dressed the way they were dressed and they didn't look the way they looked and they didn't smell the way they smelled and they didn't act the way they acted, they said you can stand in the back. Or, why don't you just sit on the floor? And James says, this shouldn't be. He says, you are guided, look at that last part there, he says, you are guided by the wrong motives. You're guided by the wrong motives. We've been talking about the fact that our belief determines our behavior. What you believe determines how you will behave. So it matters what you think. And their thinking was not being led by God. Their thinking was not being saturated in the grace that God had shown them. And they weren't understanding how God was leading them to treat each other. Belief determines behavior. When we believe wrong, we behave wrong. We've been talking about the fact that we have to find out whether we believe in God or whether we believe God. And our belief will determine our behavior. And something was wrong with their belief. So look at verse 5. James goes on. He says, listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Listen. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? And yet you insult the poor man. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? You see, they were dishonoring the poor because of their economic status when Jesus had come to proclaim that he had come for everyone. I, I really believe it's part of why he was born in a barn, in a stable. Because he wanted to show that he came for everyone. Because there was a thinking in the people's mind of Jesus' day that God had blessed rich people and that means he approved them. And if you were poor, that meant God wasn't happy with you. And Jesus came to show that he came for everyone. No matter your economic status, no matter your social background, no matter what anyone else says about you, Jesus came for you and he came for me and he came for the entire world and yet they were discriminating and dishonoring people for whom Jesus had died because they devalued them simply because of their economic status. And in this case, it didn't even make sense because there were wealthy people that were persecuting them. And yet they were the ones that they were showing the most honor to and they were preferring them over the poor. And see, what I want you to realize is that just as they had this tendency to, to discriminate, 
you and I have the same tendency. And your issue might not be rich or poor. It might not be that you look down on people who don't have a lot. But there's probably people that you look down on in life. Because you've developed a set of criteria by which you say, I am better than you. And God says that shouldn't be. That's not how we're to look at people if we have faith in Christ. If we are really people who believe God, that isn't a way that you and I should think. Because God has a different set of values than the world. But God has a different set of values. And if we are His children, if we're His followers, then we need to have a different set of values as well. You see, we, like they, have a tendency to show partiality. We show partiality based to people on their economic status. That still happens today. But we also do it about how people look, don't we? Our culture is fascinated with looks and appearances, isn't it? And that puts a lot of pressure on us. Maybe it's put pressure on you. Maybe it's put pressure on you because you feel like you don't measure up because you don't look like everyone else. Or maybe it's put pressure on you to treat people who don't look like you differently. And while looking nice is fine, God has a different set of values. Sometimes we show partiality based on what? On talent. Right? To think that because I have a certain level of talent that I am superior to somebody else because I have a different talent than they do or I think that I have more talent than they do and so we look down on people. Or conversely, maybe you feel like you're the one who's been looked down on because your talents aren't the same as someone else's. <coughs> Sometimes it's because of other things. But whatever it is, whether it's looks or economics or talent, God says this isn't how you should live. Look at verse 8. He says, yes indeed, it is good when you truly obey the Lord's royal command found in scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you pay special attention to the rich, you are committing a sin for you're guilty of breaking that law. You see, one of the things that our relationship with God does in our life is it, it, it brings us into right relationship with God vertically, right? Because we now have Jesus' righteousness. It's not about us. It's not about what we've done. It's about who Jesus is and what he did for us. And we come to faith in Christ. The Bible says we receive the righteousness of Christ, that we are clothed with his righteousness, that that becomes our identity. That's now who we are. And we're now in right relationship vertically with God because of Jesus, because of what he has done for us. Not because of ourselves, not because we deserved it, not because we earned it, but because God chose us, he loved us, he gave his son up for us. But it also affects our horizontal relationships. And God is concerned about his relationship with you vertically. He wants you to know him and walk with him. But he also is concerned about your relationships with others. And that's why Jesus said, Here was, here's the thing, I can sum up all the law and the prophets, the Old Testament scriptures, the laws that God gave to Israel, the, the commands he gave to the prophets. He says, here's, here's a quick summary for you. Love God and love people. The great commandment, right? To love God with all of your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. And then Jesus says there's a second commandment that's just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. We talked about our neighbor earlier this summer. Who's your neighbor? Anyone who isn't you. All right? It's really easy. This is one of the easiest things to ever figure out in life. Who's my neighbor? Anyone that's not you. Look next to you. All right, look at the person next to you. That's your neighbor. All right? They're your neighbor. And the Bible makes it very clear that we don't get to choose who our neighbor is. Right? Our neighbor is anyone who isn't you. And James says, you're doing well if you love your neighbor for yourself. But if you're playing favorites, you're sinning against your neighbor. And that's exactly what was going on there. And here's the thing. This is a sin that we often tend to justify. Because we, we do a pretty good job of that, don't we? we? We sort of look at what God says and we sort of feel a little bit of conviction, but then we think, but what I'm doing isn't as bad as what someone else is doing. Have you ever made yourself feel better because you compared yourself to somebody else? All right. We all have a tendency to do that. And when it comes to this sin, it's really easy to excuse yourself and say, you know, but it's not really that bad. You know, it's not as bad as what other people are doing. And it's not as bad as some sins. And I'll just avoid the big sins. Well, 
Let's consider what James has to say. Let's read on in verse 10. Because James knew that the people that he was writing to would be thinking the same way we think. And he says, A person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as the person who has broken all of God's laws. Thus, as if you break one, you break them all. For the same God who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. So if you murder someone, you have broken the entire law, even if you do not commit adultery. And I think it's really interesting that he takes these two big sins, right? How many of you would consider murder a big sin? Please raise your... Alright, I want to see every hand up. If we don't see your hand up, we are going to avoid you. Alright? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Alright. We, 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 we get that. And we get adultery, unfaithfulness. That's a big sin, right? And so James takes these big sins and he uses them to illustrate the sin that we're talking about, showing partiality. And he says, it's a big sin. So whether you speak, verse 12, or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law of liberty, the law that set you free. For there will be no mercy for you if you have not been merciful to others. If you... But if you have been merciful, then God's mercy towards you will win out over his judgment against you. Now let's take a couple of moments to think about what is actually being said here. First of all, God wants us to understand that we have been set free from the bondage of the law of sin. Right? Sin makes you a slave. That's why I talked about temptation yesterday. That's why James addressed it. Because sin doesn't bring what we think it will bring into our life. We think it will bring excitement and joy and fun. But sin makes you a slave. Sin brings darkness into our life and it brings separation with us and God. And if you're in Christ, it doesn't change the nature of your relationship with Him, but it affects your fellowship with Him. It affects our lives so powerfully. And so we realize the, the effect of sin and we need to realize that God has set me free from sin. I am set free. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I don't have to sin anymore. I'm set free by God's grace and His mercy. And so he says, if you've experienced this freedom, this mercy, if God's been merciful to you, if He's withheld His wrath and His judgment, then that should be a characteristic of our life and it should be reflected in the way that we treat others. You see, what God has done for you, He wants to reflect into this world to others. If He's shown you grace, He wants you to be gracious. If He's shown you mercy, He wants you to be merciful. If He has been kind to you, He wants you to show kindness to others. And He says, if you've experienced God's mercy, if you've experienced His grace and His kindness, it will show out in your life. And if we have no evidence of mercy in our lives, and James says, you haven't received God's mercy. He's not saying that you work to earn your faith. He's not saying that you have to do something to, to keep your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is secure by God's power and by God's grace, not by works, right? Unless anyone should boast. It's by grace that you're saved. But if you've been saved by grace, if grace is happening to you, if the God of the universe has taken up residence in you, then it will work out in your life. Not perfectly, because we're not perfect yet. But there will be some evidence that God is in you. And that's what James is arguing. He says, if there is no evidence in the way that you treat people that your life has been changed, then you should question whether you really have experienced the grace and mercy of God. He's not saying you earn it, but he's saying if you have it, it will show out. Because when we believe God, it changes our life. And there's a profound difference between believing God and believing in God. God has set you free from sin. He's been merciful to you. He's been kind to you. He did not treat you the way you deserve to be treated. Do you get that? You don't get what you deserve in Christ. What you deserve is wrath. What you deserve is judgment. But God gives you love and grace and freedom. He gives you relationship with Himself. He gives you the opportunity and the invitation to live in His kingdom and for His glory now and forever. Isn't that amazing? There's a little verse that I shared uh, at the bonfire a few weeks ago that Jesus shared with His disciples. And it says this, it says, Fear not, little flock, for it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And it, the God who gives us the kingdom wants us to live as His children and act like we have received this gift of mercy and grace. And so I want to ask you this morning, is the pressure of partiality in your life? Have you experienced this pressure? Are you experiencing this pressure? 
how do you see people? How do you treat people that are different from you? I want you to think about that. How do you treat people that are different from you? That look different from you? That talk different from you? That act different from you? People that you think maybe aren't as special as you are? How do you treat them? Do you show partiality? Let me ask you this, what kind of jokes do you tell? What kind of jokes do you tell? Our humor reveals a lot about our heart. And it's great to tell jokes. Jokes are fun. Jokes are, are not bad. But let me tell you, they also reveal something about your heart. What kind of jokes do you tell? It's a window into how you really are. You see, a lot of times we don't really want to look into the truth about ourselves, do we? Because it's not fun. It's just like looking in the mirror. Some, some of you, when you looked in the mirror this morning, it was not a pleasant experience, was it? <laughs> I'm thinking particularly over here and over here. It's not always pleasant, isn't it? But it's not always pleasant. Some of you just got that. <laughs> it's not always pleasant to look in the mirror, is it? But it's good for us, right? Because we can maybe see some things that we can correct, we can fix, we can make better. And when we truly take time to look into our hearts and our lives, we don't always like what we see. But that we come to a place where we can let God deal with us. And because He wants to set you free. He wants you to live free. The whole point of dealing with our struggles and our sin and, and letting God expose the light of His presence into our darkness is not so that we feel bad about ourselves. It's not so that we feel guilty. God brings those feelings so that we'll come to Him and confess it and deal with it and get the freedom that He offers and the forgiveness that He's so willing to give us. How do you treat people that are in no position to do anything for you? who can't help you, who can't advance you, who can't promote you, who have nothing to offer you. How you treat the people that have nothing to offer you is a great window into how you really think about people. As people have been called to faith in Christ, we're called to treat every single person that we encounter as though they are someone for whom Christ died because they are. And we should be people who are known for treating people differently. People might look at us and say, you know, I don't really buy into the whole Jesus thing and I don't really understand this whole faith thing. But I know one thing. Christians are people who treat people so well. They, they treat everybody the same. They treat everyone with love and kindness and grace. It's amazing how they treat people. But is that what they really say about us? And why is it that they don't say that about us? Because we don't do it. God calls us to treat people without partiality. We all feel the pressure to play favorites. But God calls us to live differently. I want to close with Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Paul says, in this new life, this new life that God's given you in Christ, he says, it doesn't matter if you're Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter your ethnic background. It doesn't matter your religious background. He says, it doesn't matter anymore. He says, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. It doesn't matter if you're barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. For Christ is all that matters. And he lives in all of us. You see, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. At the end of the day, here's the thing. We all have the same problem. We're all sinners. We all need redemption and grace. And it doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter how talented you are. It doesn't matter how little talent you think you have. It doesn't matter your race. It doesn't matter your religious background. You and I have the same need. And that's the need of forgiveness and the kindness of a Savior. And so does everyone else that you meet. And God wants you and I to treat them that way. And it may be this morning that as you're hearing this, God's bringing some conviction about this into your life, but it also may be that you feel like, hey, this has happened to me. People have treated me differently. And I want you to know that although people may have looked down on you and people may have treated you differently, that God looks at you with incredible love. You, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that you're God's masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. See yourself the way God sees you and then live that way. Would you bow your heads this morning? I know the tendency that we have is to justify our sin 
And if you've felt that maybe this is me, the tendency is going to be, you know what, I, I can manage this. But you can't manage it. You need to get it forgiven. So don't justify it. Bring it to the justifier. Jesus is waiting to forgive you. He's waiting to not only forgive you, but to give you the power to live differently. The power to look at people differently and treat them differently. Those of us who have received mercy are able to be merciful. And what would happen, just want you to think about what would happen if you and I truly chose to live this way? What would happen in our family? What would happen in your school? What would happen in your church if you chose to live this way? God can use you in a powerful way to make a difference when you're willing to follow Him. To not just believe in Him, but to believe Him. Father, I just pray for each of us this morning. Father, we all face the pressure of, of treating people differently based on some arbitrary reason, whether it's their looks or their talent or their background. But Father, I pray that you would help us to see that that is sin. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to realize the forgiveness and the freedom and the grace that you've given us and to see people the way you see them and to treat them the way you treated them. Father, help us because we struggle with this. And Father, I pray for those who have felt the pain of being looked down on and treated with partiality. And Father, I pray that they would rest in how you see them. And Father, they would not accept the labels that have been put on them by others, but they would define themselves by your grace and your mercy and your love and your affection and the fact that you call them a masterpiece. Father, help us to see ourselves the way you see us and to live accordingly for your glory, for your grace, and your kingdom. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.